Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Council. We're here for Pardo versus State. Is Council ready? May it please the court. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Julianne Murray of the law firm Murray Phillips, and I represent the appellant Gabriel Pardo. I thank the court for scheduling this for oral argument, particularly here at Widener, because six years ago, I was a student sitting in those seats for, as an extern for Justice Ridgely. Great. This is a little bit different than being a student. <laughs> as an attorney for the Office of Conflicts Council, I attended the Criminal Justice Forum in October, and I was very interested in a session on 11 Del C 3507, because this appeal was pending at the time, and there's an interesting 3507 issue in this case that is probably better explained orally than in the written briefs. The case involves a recorded statement of the appellant's eight-year-old son, John Pardo, and there are two questions that need to be explored. The first is whether the statement was admissible at all, and the second is whether the improper admission constitutes reversible error. The statement in question comes from John Pardo's CAC video. In the video, John Pardo says that he heard his brother Gabe say, Dad, did you hit a person? In the brief, I argue that this statement was improper double hearsay. And as much as it pains me to admit, I was wrong. It's actually triple hearsay. First, it's an out of court recorded statement. Second, the declarant John is saying something and third, John's statement is actually something that he allegedly heard his brother say, hence the triple layer. I'm arguing that this statement should not have been admitted because Gabe testified at trial that he thought his father struck a branch. It's my understanding, as I was not trial counsel, that Gabe said the same thing in his CAC video. Since he was consistent, his video was not shown at trial. The state did not ask Gabe if he said anything to his father about killing a person when he testified. Defense counsel was limited in the scope of what he could ask, so he didn't either. Enter John's testimony. Okay. John didn't remember much. And after some debate about foundational requirements, the court permitted the state to show the video. I need to stop here and point out two really significant things. The first is that this was a bench trial. And the second, is that the court acknowledged that as the trier of fact, that it would hear some information that the jury might not hear and assured counsel that it would only consider evidence that was appropriate. Since, since the brother's alleged statement was made mm -hmm. at the time that this accident occurred, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't it fall under what we used to call the rest yesterday exceptions, the, the first three or four exceptions in the hearsay rule? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear exactly what you said at the end of that, Your Honor. Would, wouldn't the brother's statement fall under what we used to call the rest yesterday rule, which is essentially the first two or three exceptions uh, in, the, uh, in the hearsay rule for excited utterances or statements made while you're perceiving an event, things like that? I don't think so, Your Honor, but it's a fair question. And, I th and actually, at trial, when um, there was a sidebar where um, defense counsel was, you know, asking what the, you know, what the basis was, and there was a proffer that it was going to come in as a present sense impression or an excited utterance, but the court didn't actually rule on it. The court basically said, I haven't seen the video yet, let's look at the video, and I'll only use it as it's, you know, as, as appropriate. But the issue here is that John said he heard his brother say, okay? And the brother Gabe was actually available at trial to, to be asked that question. And he wasn't. So what happened is that essentially the, the testimony comes in or the statement comes in in a way that was irrefutable. Hey, Gabe testified first, then John testifies. And basically he says, I don't remember. Okay, so there was definitely a discussion about the foundational requirements, whether he had answered that he testified truthfully, whether it touched on the events of that night. Okay? And after a discussion about the foundation requirements, they allowed the video to be shown. 35 minute video, and about 14 and a half minutes in, when he's prompted by the interviewer, he says that, you know, as to what his brother was doing, he says, my brother said, dad, did you kill a person? And then he goes on to something else. 
from, from my perspective, the issue is that Gabe was available to answer that question. And in general, the court would want live testimony as opposed to a recorded statement that somebody else said he said. Um, and basically, it's significant because this is the only piece of evidence or the piece of evidence that suggests Mr. Pardo knew he hit a person. You don't quarrel with the fact that 3507, in fact, expressly allows hearsay testimony. I do not quarrel with that fact. I do not. But, what I, but I do understand, or at least my understanding, is that if you're going to let hearsay in, particularly say, well, let's just say it's double hearsay. Okay, if you're going to let double hearsay in, it has to come in. Um, each part of those statements has to qualify under one of the exceptions. And what I'm saying is I don't believe that this fits under one of the exceptions. What was the basis for the objection in the trial court to its admissibility? Um, the basis, the initial basis was foundation. Basically that because um, John Pardo testified that he couldn't remember what happened that night, that that was not enough to be inconsistent as is required under 3507. And the court actually did agree with that. They said that basically, I agree, not remembering is not quite enough, so now you need to touch upon it. And then they went back and asked additional questions. So that, are we reviewing the hearsay argument you're making for plain error on appeal? No, because I think that there was a proper objection made at trial. If, if a person says, I can't remember, mm -hmm. Uh, doesn't that qu qualify as touching upon? I think there are cases on that where, where people have had issues after a crime and they, they say they just can't remember what happened. And I, I think there are cases that say that, although it may not be literally touching, touching on, it, right. that it satisfies the touching on requirement. I, I think there are such cases. I'm not familiar with specific cases specifically about the I don't remember. Um, and I do think that the court handled it appropriately from the standpoint of they said that the um, I don't remember may not be a sufficient foundation. So they did get to the touching upon. The issue is whether or not the statement should have come in at all, basically. I mean, I think that from a foundation standpoint, it's arguable that the foundation was met. But when you start talking about one person saying that they heard another person say something and that other person is available to actually be asked at trial, Gabe, did you say, Dad, did you kill a person? That question was never asked. And I think that that was intentional. I think that they, from a confrontation clause standpoint, I think they wanted the statement in in a way that could not be refuted. And the problem is that you know, it is in the verdict, okay, so it's a bench trial, and the court referred to the statement in the verdict. Okay, so when you start talking about A, should it have even come in, and then B, should it, does it constitute reversible error, at AR 17, in the reply brief, in the verdict, the court said, quote, Mr. Bishop was thrown over the roof of the Audi in full view of the rear seat passenger, Gabriel Pardo, through the open sunroof. This young son exclaimed, Dad, did you kill a person? While there was evidence, okay, end quote, while there was evidence that Mr. Bishop did fly over the car when he was struck, there is no evidence that Gabe saw him flying over the car or exclaimed anything. Gabe never testified to this. So it's a dangerous statement that, that I think is constitutes reversible error in this particular case. If Gabe was available to testify to his own statement and his recollections, he should have been asked those questions. Could you, and, could you I didn't want to you burn all your time on that one argument. Could you get to the due process argument? Though? The, the constitutionality argument? Sure. Yes. And that was my next sentence. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in addition to this, there is the issue of whether 21 Del C 4202 is strict liability. Okay, so I believe. 4202 is strict liability because liability attaches without intent. And 4202 is part of Title 21, just like 4176, operating a motor vehicle involving death. Would you agree that 4202 requires that the defendant know at least that he or she has been in a collision? Yes. Okay, I mean, while it is my position that 4202 is strict liability, I'm an attorney, I have to see both sides of the issue, and I can absolutely see the state's position that rather than strict liability, that there is a knowing mens rea. 
but there's a disagreement about what has to be known. Okay? The Superior Court hedged, and the, uh, there was a motion for judgment of acquittal filed by trial counsel. And in that, there was an argument about the constitutionality of 4202, but there was also an argument that leaving the scene of an accident involving death basically had um, a knowing element, and the court said he knew. Okay? And the court also said, but he didn't have to know that he was in an accident involving injury or death. He just had to know he was in an accident. Okay? My position, the appellant's position, is that if you're going to be convicted of a felony and up to five years of imprisonment, that the driver must know that the accident involved or resulted in injury or death to a person. And I realize, you know, this begs the question of how someone could not know that they hit a person. And my response is that you would have to know Brackenville Road. Well, sometimes you have to stop to find out whether somebody's injured, don't you? I, I totally agree with you. And in this particular case, and I mean, and I realize that it sounds, it sounds like excuses, and that's not how I mean it to sound. But the circumstances of this night, it's 9 o'clock at night. This, the, uh, Mr. Pardo was one-third of a mile from his house. He is on a road that is curvy with no shoulder, and he has three young children in the car. He thinks he hits a branch. His windshield is shattered, but he can still see through it enough to go home. Okay? So he drives the third of the mile to his house, okay? and that's where he assesses the vehicle. He sees that the windshield is cracked. He sees that or he doesn't see, there's no blood, there's no visible, at, from the garage, there's no visible evidence that he struck a person. Well, he told the police the following morning that he either struck a deer or a stick, right? A, a, a branch. A branch. Correct, yes. And, and basically, that, the next morning, there, it was on the news that there was a, um, that someone had been killed the night before, that they were driving an Audi, and you know, he did call, and he said, I'm driving an Audi and I struck something last night. And he maintained through the, through his questioning, it, you know, when he was arrested from the t and from you know through trial, he maintained he thought he struck a branch. To what extent does the uh, Morissetti test apply here? And is it your position that any felony offense would run afoul of it by besmirching a person's reputation? Good question. Um, the the Morissette test basically says that under a strict liability analysis that it, it passes muster if the penalty is relatively small and it doesn't gravely besmirch. My position is that six months, a year to, uh, one year to five years is not relatively small. Six months of that cannot be suspended. And in fact, there are many appellate court cases that say any incarceration meets that test, right? Um, meets the test meaning that it kind of besmirches your reputation, and it's not trivial if you're incarcerated. Uh, you are absolutely correct, and yes. So in this case, it's, you know, and, and the problem in a due process evaluation from the court's perspective is you have to, you know, analyze it as it's written and then also as applied. So in this case, Mr. Carter was sentenced to three years under this, uh, under, uh, under the 4202 um, statute. Okay. Now, in terms of whether I believe a felony gravely besmirches the reputation, the answer to that is yes. Well, you could have a situation where, <clears throat> say, person A is sentenced to two years incarceration under 4202B, which is collision causing injury, but not a fatality. Okay. And another person incarcerated for, sentenced to a year with six months suspended under C, yep. which is collision causing a fa fatality, and B is an unclassified misdemeanor. So which besmirches a person's reputation more in that case? Well, it's a two-part test. Okay, so under B, if you were sentenced to two years, that would, it would fail under Morissette for the not being relatively small. And C is, you know, it would fail because it's a felony. And I mean, and when you consider the loss of civil rights that happens with a felony, um, I do think that it gravely besmirches the reputation. And, you know, and, and this court, when they analyzed Hoover, um, which is 4176, I realize it is not the same as 4202, but they're both Title 21 offenses, you know, sp specifically noted that it was a misdemeanor as opposed to a felony, 
and specifically said that it, had not, it was not going to weigh in on whether, in that case, 30 months was a relatively small um, sentence for the crime. The other thing I would like to point out is that from the standpoint of whether or not the knowing is, you know, if, if the court decides it's not strict liability, okay, and they decide that there is a knowing mens rea, okay, the, um, the 3507 issue absolutely comes back into play because it is the piece of evidence that suggests he knew he hit a person. And if I, you know, from my position, I'm arguing that he had to know he hit a person in order to be held to that, you know, to be found guilty of that crime. Okay? So if he is going to be found guilty of that crime, that, that the knowing piece is, you know, whether or not he knew becomes very critical. If I may, I'd actually like to reserve the rest for my rebuttal. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Vella. <clears throat> May it please the court, good morning. Andrew Vella on behalf of the state. Section 4202 of Title 21 uh, is not unconstitutional. It is not a strict liability statute that requires or triggers an analysis under Morissette. Can you, can you just um, clarify whether or not, uh, did the state take the position um, in the proceedings below that it was not a strict liability statute? I believe the state took that position as well as saying if it is, then it does not, it does not qualify under Morissette as something that is unconstitutional. However, I think that on appeal at this point, the state's position is it's simply not a strict liability offense and the court can affirm on that basis as opposed to the original basis that the Superior Court found this to be not unconstitutional. In other words, the Superior Court did the, did the Morissette analysis and found that it was not un unconstitutional. I don't know that the court has to decide it on that mm -hmm. issue. I think the court can, uh, and, and the Superior Court alternatively held that it is not a strict liability uh, statute, and I think the court can uh, affirm on that basis. Well, under the state's theory, what does the defendant have to know? The, under the state's theory, the defendant has to know that he was involved in a collision. And I understand- Does he, ha does he have to know whether it was a collision with a person? No, as opposed that is, to just that, no, and I think this gets back to your <coughs> earlier comment, Justice Vaughn, which is, well, sometimes you have to get out of the car and find out. Um, and I think that's what the intent of the statute is. When you read it in Parimateria with 4201, and you look at the legislative uh, history or the legislative record for this, it's clear that what the, the purpose of the law is to impose a duty upon a driver to do just that, get out of the car and check to see what you hit, whether it's, whether it's property, or whether it's a person, or whether you don't know, you're obligated to go and find out. Uh, and you're obligated to stay there if there's something that's damaged or someone who's injured. So, the, uh, excuse me, the best case you had on that point was the one Georgia case that was in the footnote in your brief. Yes. I didn't see any other authority on this, which seems to make a distinction between specific intent in a crime and general intent. Now, I'm still not sure how general intent <clears throat> is really satisfying a mens rea requirement for a crime. And I don't, I don't think the intent we're talking about is, in, uh, I don't think the mens rea we're talking about is intent. It's, it's knowing and it's knowledge. There's no intentional action on the part of uh, a driver here. It's his knowledge that, that he or she has been involved in a collision. And so there's not, a, there's not a specific intent or a general intent. It's, it's simply the knowledge that you've been in an accident. Um, so that's the mens rea we're dealing with. It's not we, the higher. Do we have to read 4201 into 4202 in order to make it not a strict liability statute? I don't know that the court has to read 4201 uh, in, order to, or in order to find 4202 to be constitutional. I think when you read it, you get a better idea of what the legislature was trying to do at the time. Because 4201 talks about apparent damage to property, uh, where 4202 <coughs> does not. However, when you read them in par materia, I think the court gets a better understanding of the purpose of the legislation. And when we back that up with the legislative record, it's pretty clear 
that this was not intended, neither 4201 or 4202, but I understand we're just talking about 4202, was not intended to be a strict liability offense. Um, and, and the court, uh, the Superior Court, uh, accurately talked about what the knowledge requirement is and how it, a common sense reading of the statute necessarily leads you to, well, the driver had to know that they were in a collision. And, that not, and in this case, that, that was satisfied. That mens rea was satisfied, and the court found that it was satisfied. It was very specifically saying Mr. Pardo knew that he had been in a collision and he was therefore obligated to stop his car, get out, and find out what happened. Well, given the seriousness of the penalty, felony level crime, wouldn't it seem to follow that the person must know that he was in an accident and that it, at, at least that somebody might have been injured? Well, then I think we start talking about degrees of what the person knew, degrees of knowledge. Well, did they know they were, they were hurt? Did they know how badly they were hurt? Was it a situation where they had to know that they were going to possibly, they were possibly going to die? I think knowledge of, and what the, the Superior Court said, and I think this accurately lays out the mens rea for this particular offense, is the statute requires drivers involved in an accident to stop at the scene to determine whether a person is injured and determine whether a person was injured or killed. Um, but here the court said the, the requirement to stop at the scene is not conditional upon whether a driver knew someone had been injured or killed. And I think that's an accurate reading of the statute. Um, because then you'd be imposing essentially two mens reas. Not only would you have to know that this person's involved in a collision, um, and then you have to know whether someone else is in injured or not. And I think it really does get back to that just basic point that you made, Justice Vaughn. Sometimes you have to stop and find out what happened. And I think that's the intent of the statute. And, and the differentiation between 4201 and 4202 is property versus personal injury. Um, it is not a strict liability statute. Uh, it was not intended to be a strict liability statute. Uh, a, there is no need for an analysis under Morissette, and the court can affirm on the basis that it is not a strict liability offense, and it, there is a mens rea that can be read into it. Does the court have any other issues that you would like to see? What's, what, uh, after having listened to uh, counsel's argument on the 3507, Point. Could you, I mean, we have the briefs, but could you just articulate? I, I can. Um, well, two, two things. Uh, I understand that sometimes the oral argument might sound better or might be better made, and so that's why it's not really briefed out very well. However, this wasn't preserved with an objection. I think we are here on plain error, and I think, the, I think you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't remind the court, this comes in the context of a appeal from a motion for a judgment of acquittal. And the standard is, was there enough evidence for any rational fact finder, um, trier of fact, to find beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Pardo was guilty. And here, if we talk about the 3507, the 3507 had a separate basis for its admission. The objection was to the foundation. And, this, that, and the, court, the court brought that up. The state cured whatever foundational deficiency there was and the statement was admitted. Now, within that 3507 statement, there was a hearsay statement. However, as, as you pointed out, Justice Vaughn, that comes under the res geste exceptions. It could be either excited utterance or a present sense impression. Um, and when we back up and look at the entire, the, the, issue, the issue is, was there enough evidence so that any rational trial, of fact, viewed, and, and the evidence viewed in the light most favorable to the state uh, could have found Mr. Pardo guilty. And, and here there was, the state satisfied its burden and the court did not uh, abuse its discretion when it denied that motion. But those, those exceptions to the hearsay rule only apply if it's first level hearsay. It does, they don't apply if it's second level hearsay. Well, I think, I think the way we get to this, it, it's, it becomes first level hearsay insofar as John's initial statement to, on the, third, on the, on the tape, that's admitted not under, hearsay rules, that's admitted under 3507. So that's not a hear so I, we talk about it being hearsay within hearsay or double hearsay, but that's just not the way that we look at it um, because the statement, 
that comes in is com comes in under 3507, not under a hearsay exception. So John's statement, the tape statement itself, is not a hearsay statement. It's a statement that's admitted pursuant but to 3507. But 3507 doesn't immunize second level hearsay within the 3507 statement. It does not immunize it. However, that is still, I, the state's position is that that would still be analyzed under the traditional hearsay exception analysis. So is that second statement, um, the, the brother's statement about what the, what the dad said, is that going to be an excited utterance or, or is it going to be um, a present sense impression? And the state suggests that it satisfies both here. Um, and to the extent that it was improperly considered by the court, when we look at it in the context of the greater issue of whether there was enough evidence for any rational find, fact finder um, to find that he was guilty, viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the state, even if we were to excise that, there, the, the court did not abuse its discretion uh, when it denied the motion because there was, in fact, plenty of evidence um, to convict him absent that statement. I mean, and, and we talk about the focus of the statement being well, that's really the only evidence that he knew um, that he had hit someone, that Mr. Pardo knew that he had hit someone as opposed to something. Well, the physical evidence in the case is there are handlebar imprints on his hood. And that suggests certainly that he would have seen someone crash into his hood and fly over the roof of the car. So there is other evidence of his knowledge. This isn't the sole evidence. Um, this is a, a small piece of that evidence because the facts, the, the facts themselves, uh, his admission to driving on the wrong side of the road, the debris field, and just the physical evidence itself uh, demonstrated his knowledge that he had hit someone. And again, the, state, the state's position is that he just needed to know that he was in a collision, and he knew that he was in a collision. What precisely was the trial court's finding on whether he just knew he was in a I'm not talking about, I'm just talking about the, 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 uh, the manslaughter conviction. Yes. What, what specifically did the court find as to whether he knew he was in an accident with something or whether he knew he was in an accident with a person? Well, the, the specific finding that the court made, I, I think that, might, that the Superior Court made is this. Um, he knew he was involved, and these are the court's words, he knew he was involved in the collision and he knowingly and intentionally left the scene without first determining whether anyone was injured or killed. He conceded that he knew he had been in an accident and he admitted that he drove away without stopping. So that's as close as we get to a specific finding. That's as close as we get to a specific finding. But th those are the court's words in its decision, in its written decision right. on the motion for judgment of acquittal and motion for new trial. Mm -hmm. If the court doesn't have any further questions, thank you. We ask that you affirm. Thank, thank you. As you know, in the rebuttal, it's kind of a, a, a hit, just to hit a couple of different points. Uh, the first is that when the Superior Court did the analysis under Morissette, uh, they, the Superior Court focused only on the minimum portion of the sentence the six months which could not be suspended, and said, that's not relatively small. And then made the statement that, bas that said basically, and it's a felony, but it doesn't gravely besmirch the reputation. So there was not a, a, a lot more than that in that analysis. The other thing uh, at, at, uh, for you, uh, Justice Seitz, is that when we talk about whether it's plain error, whether it was preserved, and you know when we're talking about the 3507 issue, in the context of a bench trial, when there are sidebars and there's counsel talking to the judge, and the judge says, we discussed previously at sidebar the fact that the court is the trier of fact is going to hear some information that the jury might not hear, so I'll consider any <coughs> motions to strike. Trial counsel, fine. Court, all right, and we'll only consider the evidence that is appropriate. Trial counsel, fine. At that point, you know, the, the court has said, essentially, trust me, I'm only going to look at what I'm supposed to be looking at. So in terms of further objections to a, you know, the content and what was going on once that video was shown, I think that it's significant that the court had basically said the equivalent of, relax, I'm only going to look at what I'm supposed to be looking at. 
The third point is that as far as the legislative history goes, and I, I realize I'm skipping around, but you know how the time goes. Um, as far as the uh, knowing element as it relates to 4202, I think that the legislative history actually favors the argument that they had to know that they were in a collision resulting in injury or death. Did, pardon me for interrupting. Did, sure. did, the, uh, did the trial court ever actually make a finding of fact that the one son had made the statement to the effect of, Dad, did you just kill somebody? Because, you know, in the, uh, in the uh, written opinion, written post-trial, she, she detailed what she found factually, and that doesn't, doesn't seem to be in there. Um, in, in, the reply, in the appendix to the reply brief, I believe it's AR-17, in the verdict, the, the court actually referred to the statement and said that when Mr. Bishop was struck and flew over the car, that the young son saw him through the sunroof and exclaimed, Dad, did you kill a person? Okay. So, I mean, so in terms of when the court does its findings of fact, I don't know that it was enumerated that way, but it absolutely was, you know, stated as fact by the court. On the legislative history um, point that you just made, the state included the, trans the mm -hmm. CD. Of absolutely. The the, the Senate hearings, and I thought Mr. Wood testified that you don't actually have to have knowledge that you hit a person. You just have to have knowledge. The whole point is to incentivize people to go back and find out whether, whether or not um, there is uh, an injury or a fatality. I agree to a point, but the, if you read the entire, you hear the entire thing, basically the Legislature was concerned about ascribing a felony and, and up to five years of imprisonment for um, an accident. Okay? And, and they were, they did not intend to enact a statute that imposes a criminal penalty on a driver who, regardless of their knowledge of the accident or injury, would be strictly liable for the outcome. I think that the intent was, yes, you should stop, okay, but that if you were in an accident involving injury or death, you need to know that you were in an accident involving injury or death. But I think what they were trying to do also, isn't it the case that they, um, the penalty scheme in place then was that people would be incentivized to flee if they Agreed. were intoxicated. Agreed. And so they were ratcheting up the penalties um, on, in, in instances of fatalities to incentivize people to stay. I, isn't that right? I would agree with you. All right, thank you very All right, much. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent arguments. We'll take the matter under advisement. Thank you.